a last-minute shopping excursion leads to a Christmas miracle in the country. Lucy Maud Montgomery, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. The vintage episodes are back. Check us out on Tuesday for The Adventure of the Blue Carbuncle by Arthur Conan Doyle. The vintage episodes will not stream through YouTube, so if you don't want to miss anything, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And please become a monthly supporter to help to keep this good thing going. Go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com and become a monthly supporter for as little as $5 a month. As a thank you gesture, we'll send you a coupon code every month for at least $8 off any audiobook order. Give more and you get more. It's a great way to help us keep treating these amazing stories with the care they deserve. Go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com and become a supporter today. And now, Christmas at Red Butte by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Of course Santa Claus will come, said Jimmy Martin confidently. Jimmy was ten, and at ten it is easy to be confident. Why, he has got to come, because it is Christmas Eve, and he has always come. You know that, twins. Yes, the twins knew it, and cheered by Jimmy's superior wisdom, their doubts passed away. There had been one terrible moment when Theodora had sighed and told them they mustn't be too much disappointed if Santa Claus did not come this year because the crops had been poor, and he mightn't have had enough presents to go around. That doesn't make any difference to Santa Claus, scoffed Jimmy. You know as well as I do, Theodora Prentice, that Santa Claus is rich, whether the crops fail or not. They failed three years ago, before Father died, but Santa Claus came all the same. Probably you don't remember it, twins, because you were too little, but I do. Of course he'll come, so don't you worry a mite. And he'll bring my skates and your dolls. He knows we're expecting them, Theodora, because we wrote him a letter last week and threw it up the chimney. And there'll be candy and nuts, of course. And Mother's gone to town to buy a turkey. I tell you, we're going to have a ripping Christmas. Well, don't use slangy words about it, Jimmy boy, sighed Theodora. She couldn't bear to dampen their hopes any further, and perhaps Aunt Elizabeth might manage it if the colt sold well. But Theodora had her painful doubts, and she sighed again as she looked out the window far down the trail that wound across the prairie, red-lighted by the declining sun of the short, wintry afternoon. Do people always sigh like that when they get to be sixteen? asked Jimmy curiously. You didn't sigh like that when you were only fifteen, Theodora. I wish you wouldn't. It makes me feel funny. And it's not a nice kind of funniness either. It's a bad habit I've gotten into lately, said Theodora, trying to laugh. Old folks are dull sometimes, you know, Jimmy boy. Sixteen is awful old, isn't it? said Jimmy reflectively. I'll tell you what I'm going to do when I'm sixteen, Theodora. I'm going to pay off the mortgage and buy mother a silk dress and a piano for the twins. Won't that be elegant? And I'll be able to do that, because I'm a man. Of course, if I was only a girl, I couldn't. I hope you'll be a good, kind, brave man, and a real help to your mother, said Theodora softly, sitting down before the cozy fire, and lifting the fat little twins into her lap. Oh, I'll be good to her, never you fear, assured Jimmy, squatting comfortably down on the little fur rug before the stove, the skin of the coyote his father had killed four years ago. I believe in being good to your mother when you've only got the one. Now, tell us a story, Theodora. A real jolly story, you know, with lots of fighting in it. Only please don't kill anybody. I like to hear about the fighting, but I'd like to have all the people come out alive. Theodora laughed and began a story about the real rebellion of 85. A story which had the double merit of being true and exciting at the same time. It was quite dark when she finished, and the twins were nodding. But Jimmy's eyes were wide open and sparkling. That was great, he said, drawing a long breath. Tell us another. No, it's bedtime for you all, said Theodora firmly. One story at a time is my rule, you know. 
but I want to sit up till Mother comes home, objected Jimmy. You can't. She may be very late, for she would have to wait to see Mr. Porter. Besides, you don't know what time Santa Claus might come, if he comes at all. If he were to drive along and see you children up instead of being sound asleep in bed, he might go right on and never call at all. This argument was too much for Jimmy. All right, we'll go, but we have to hang up our stockings first. Twins, get yours. The twins toddled off in great excitement and brought back their Sunday stockings, which Jimmy proceeded to hang along the edge of the mantel shelf. This done, they all trooped obediently off to bed. Theodora gave another sigh and seated herself at the window, where she could watch the moonlit prairie for Mrs. Martin's homecoming and knit at the same time. I am afraid that you will think from all the sighing Theodora was doing, she was a very melancholy and despondent young lady. You couldn't think anything more unlike the real Theodora. She was the jolliest, bravest girl of sixteen in all Saskatchewan, as her shining brown eyes and rosy, dimpled cheeks would have told you. And her sighs were not on her own account, but simply for fear the children were going to be disappointed. She knew that they would be almost heartbroken if Santa Claus did not come, and that this would hurt the patient, hard-working little mother more than anything else. Five years before this, Theodora had come to live with Uncle George and Aunt Elizabeth in the little log house at Red Butte. Her own mother had just died, and Theodora had only her big brother Donald left, and Donald had Klondike fever. The Martins were poor, but they had gladly made room for their little niece, and Theodora had lived there ever since, her aunt's right-hand girl and the beloved playmate of the children. They had been very happy, until Uncle George's death two years before this Christmas Eve. But since then there had been hard times in the little log house, and though Mrs. Martin and Theodora did their best, it was a woefully hard task to make both ends meet, especially this year when their crops had been poor. Theodora and her aunt had made every sacrifice possible for the children's sake, and at least Jimmy and the twins had not felt the pinch very severely yet. At seven, Mrs. Martin's bells jingled at the door, and Theodora flew out. Go right in and get warm, Auntie, she said briskly. I'll take Ned away and unharness him. It's a bitterly cold night, said Mrs. Martin wearily. There was a note of discouragement in her voice, that struck dismay to Theodora's heart. I'm afraid it means no Christmas for the children tomorrow, she thought sadly, as she led Ned away to the stable. When she returned to the kitchen, Mrs. Martin was sitting by the fire, her face in her chilled hand, sobbing convulsively. Auntie, oh, Auntie, don't, exclaimed Theodora impulsively. It was such a rare thing to see her plucky, resolute little aunt in tears. You're cold and tired. I'll have a nice cup of tea for you in a trice. No, it isn't that, said Mrs. Martin brokenly. It was seeing those stockings hanging there. Theodora, I couldn't get a thing for the children, not a single thing. Mr. Porter would only give forty dollars for the colt, and when all the bills were paid, there was barely enough left for such necessaries as we must have. I suppose I ought to feel thankful I could get those. But the thought of the children's disappointment tomorrow is more than I can bear. It would have been better to have told them long ago, but I kept building on getting more for the colt. Well, it's weak and foolish to give way like this. We'd better both take a cup of tea and go to bed. It will save fuel. When Theodora went up to her little room, her face was very thoughtful. She took a small box from her table and carried it to the window. In it was a very pretty little gold locket hung on a narrow blue ribbon. Theodora held it tenderly in her fingers and looked out over the moonlit prairie with a very sober face. Could she give up her dear locket, the locket Donald had given her just before he started for the Klondike? She had never thought she could do such a thing. It was almost the only thing she had to remind her of Donald. Handsome, merry, impulsive, warm-hearted Donald, who had gone away four years ago with a smile on his bonny face and splendid hope in his heart. Here's a locket for you, gift of God, he had said gaily. 
He had such a dear, loving habit of calling her by the beautiful meaning of her name. A lump came to Theodora's throat as she remembered it. I couldn't afford a chain, too, but when I come back, I'll buy you a rope of Klondike nuggets for it. Then he had gone away. For two years, letters had come from him regularly. Then he wrote that he had joined a prospecting party to a remote wilderness. After that came silence, deepening into anguish of suspense that finally ended in hopelessness. A rumor came that Donald Prentice was dead. None had returned from the expedition he had joined. Theodora had long ago given up all hope of ever seeing Donald again. Hence her locket was doubly dear to her. But Aunt Elizabeth had always been so good and loving and kind to her. Could she not make the sacrifice for her sake? Yes, she could and would. Theodora flung up her head with a gesture that meant decision. She took out of the locket the bits of hair, her mother's and Donald's, which it contained. Perhaps a tear or two fell as she did so. And then hastily donned her warmest cap and wraps. It was only three miles to Spencer. She could easily walk it in an hour, and as it was Christmas Eve, the shops would be open late. She must walk, for Ned could not be taken out again, and the mare's foot was sore. Besides, Aunt Elizabeth must not know until it was done. As stealthily as if she were bound on some nefarious errand, Theodora slipped downstairs and out of the house. The next minute, she was hurrying along the trail in the moonlight. The great, dazzling prairie was around her, the mystery and splendor of the northern night all about her. It was very calm and cold, but Theodora walked so briskly that she kept warm. The trail from Red Butte to Spencer was a lonely one. Mr. Lurgan's house, halfway to town, was the only dwelling on it. When Theodora reached Spencer, she made her way at once to the only jewelry store the little town contained. Mr. Benson, its owner, had been a friend of her uncle's, and Theodora felt sure that he would buy her locket. Nevertheless, her heart beat quickly, and her breath came and went uncomfortably fast as she went in. Suppose he wouldn't buy it. Then there would be no Christmas for the children at Red Butte. Good evening, Miss Theodora, said Mr. Benson briskly. What can I do for you? I'm afraid I'm not a very welcome sort of customer, Mr. Benson, said Theodora with an uncertain smile. I want to sell, not buy. Could you, will you, buy this locket? Mr. Benson pursed his lips, took up the locket, and examined it. Well, I don't often buy second-hand stuff, he said after some reflection. But I don't mind obliging you, Miss Theodora. I'll give you four dollars for this trinket. Theodora knew the locket had cost a great deal more than that, but four dollars would get what she wanted and she dared not ask for more. In a few minutes, the locket was in Mr. Benson's possession, and Theodora, with four crisp new bills in her purse, was hurrying to the toy store. Half an hour later, she was on her way back to Red Butte, with as many parcels as she could carry. Jimmy skates, two lovely dolls for the twins, packages of nuts and candy, and a nice plump turkey. Theodora beguiled her lonely tramp, by picturing the children's joy in the morning. About a quarter of a mile past Mr. Lurgan's house, the trail curved suddenly about a bluff of poplars. As Theodora rounded the turn, she halted in amazement. Almost at her feet, the body of a man was lying across the road. He was clad in a big fur coat and had a fur cap pulled well down over his forehead and ears. Almost all of him that could be seen was a full bushy beard, Theodora had no idea who he was or where he had come from. But she realized that he was unconscious and that he would speedily freeze to death if help were not brought. The footprints of a horse galloping across the prairie suggested a fall and a runaway, but Theodora did not waste time in speculation. She ran back at full speed to Mr. Lurgan's and roused the household. In a few minutes, Mr. Lurgan and his son had hitched a horse to a wood sleigh and hurried down the trail to the unfortunate man. Theodora, knowing that her assistance was not needed, and that she ought to get home as quickly as possible, went on her way as soon as she had seen the stranger in safe keeping. When she reached the little log house, she crept in, cautiously put the children's gifts in their stockings, 
placed the turkey on the table, where Aunt Elizabeth would see it first thing in the morning, and then slipped off to bed, a very weary but very happy girl. The joy that reigned in the little log house the next day more than repaid Theodora for her sacrifice. Whoopee! Didn't I tell you that Santa Claus would come all right? shouted the delighted Jimmy. Oh, what splendid skates! The twins hugged their dolls in silent rapture, but Aunt Elizabeth's face was the best of all. Then the dinner had to be prepared, and everybody had a hand in that. Just as Theodora, after a grave peep into the oven, had announced that the turkey was done, a sleigh dashed around the house. Theodora flew to answer the knock at the door, and there stood Mr. Lurgan and a big, bewhiskered, fur-coated fellow, whom Theodora recognized as the stranger she had found on the trail. But was he a stranger? There was something oddly familiar in those merry brown eyes. Theodora felt herself growing dizzy. Donald? She gasped. Oh, Donald! And then she was in the big fellow's arms, laughing and crying at the same time. Donald it was indeed. And then followed half an hour during which everybody talked at once, and the turkey would have been burnt to a crisp had it not been for the presence of mind of Mr. Lurgan, who, being the least excited of them all, took it out of the oven and set it on the back of the stove. To think that it was you last night, and that I never dreamed it, exclaimed Theodora. Oh, Donald, if I hadn't gone to town... I'd have frozen to death, I'm afraid, said Donald soberly. I got into Spencer on the last train last night. I felt that I must come right out. I couldn't wait till morning. But there wasn't a team to be got for love or money. It was Christmas Eve, and all the livery rigs were out. So I came on horseback. Just by that bluff, something frightened my horse, and he shied violently. I was half asleep and thinking of my little sister and I went off like a shot. I suppose I struck my head against a tree. Anyway, I knew nothing more until I came to in Mr. Lurgan's kitchen. I wasn't much hurt, feel none the worse of it except for a sore head and shoulder. But, oh, gift of God, how you have grown. I can't realize that you are the little sister I left four years ago. I suppose you've been thinking I was dead. Yes, and, oh, Donald, where have you been? Well, I went way up north with a prospecting party. We had a tough time the first year, I can tell you, and some of us never came back. We weren't in a country where post offices were lying round loose either, you see. Then at last, just as we were about giving up in despair, we struck it rich. I've brought a snug little pile home with me, and things are going to look up in this log house, gift to God. There'll be no more worrying for you dear people over mortgages. I'm so glad, for Auntie's sake, said Theodora, with shining eyes. But, oh, Donald, it's the best of all just to have you back. I'm so perfectly happy that I don't know what to do or say. Well, I think you might have dinner, said Jimmy in an injured tone. The turkey's getting stone cold and I'm most starving. I can't stand it another minute. So with a laugh, they all sat down to the table and ate the merriest Christmas dinner the little log house had ever known. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of Christmas at Red Butte by Lucy Maud Montgomery. If you've enjoyed this episode, please become a supporter so we can keep a good thing going. Go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com and become a supporter today for as little as $5 a month. And thanks for pitching in. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me next time and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs>